Good morning, uh, and welcome to the Blair House. I'm Ezra Klein, founder and editor-in-chief of Vox here alongside my colleague Sarah Cliff. We are honored to be here today to speak with President Obama about the Affordable Care Act, its performance, its passage, and its now uncertain future. I think we'd all prefer to hear from him than from me, so I won't waste any more of your time with introduction. Please join me in welcoming President Barack Obama. Hello, hello, hello. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for being here. <laughs> yeah. It is great to be here. And thank you so much for all the good reporting you guys have been doing on this important issue. All right. Well, thank you. So we will get started. Um, so there was an expectation that was shared among many of your staff, many congressional Democrats, yeah. that as the Affordable Care Act rolled out, as it delivered benefits to millions of people, that it would become more popular. It would be safe from repeal or even substantial reform. And it appears at this point that doesn't seem to be quite true. What do you think that theory got wrong? Why didn't the health care law become more popular? Well, l let's back up and uh, say from the start there's a reason why uh, for 100 years no president could get expansion of health care coverage uh, beyond uh, the work that had been done uh, for Medicare and Medicaid, uh, targeting primarily seniors. Uh, and the reason was that this is hard. Uh, the healthcare system is big. It is very personal. Uh, families, I think, recognize the need for health insurance, but it's not something that uh, they think about except when things go wrong, when you have an accident or you're sick. Uh, and so. Uh, any costs, particularly at a time when families are feeling stressed economically, any added costs, higher premiums, higher copays, all that uh, ends up uh, having real impacts on families. And so the challenge of getting it passed uh, was always uh, the fact that uh, unlike other advanced countries, uh, we didn't start with a system in which everybody was covered. And we have a very complicated marketplace, and we have third-party insurers. And what that meant was that even after we got the law passed, anything that dissatisfied people about the health care system could be attributed to, quote, unquote, Obamacare, even if it had nothing to do with Obamacare. Uh, and, and that was something that we recognized even when we were uh, trying to get the law passed. But the other thing is the fact that uh, the unwillingness of uh, Republicans in Congress and around the country, including some governors, to, after the fight was over, mm -hmm. to say, all right, let's try to make this work the way Democrats did during uh, the time when President Bush tried to expand uh, the prescription drug program, Part D, uh, meant that the public never heard from uh, those who had originally been opposed uh, any concession that, you know what, this is actually doing some good. And that ends up affecting public opinion. Uh, and the third thing is that whenever you look at polls that say, well, 40-something percent mm -hmm. are supportive of the law and 40-something uh, percent are dissatisfied, in the dissatisfied column are a whole bunch of Bernie Sanders supporters who want a single-payer plan. <laughs> uh, and so the problem is not that they think Obamacare is a failure. The problem is that they don't think it went far enough and that it left too many people still uncovered, that the subsidies uh, that people were getting weren't as rich as they should have been, that there's a way of uh, dealing with uh, 
prescription drug makers in a, in, in a way that uh, drives down those costs. And, and so uh, all those things meant that uh, even after the law was passed, there was going to still be a lot of tough politics. Having said all that, the thing that I've been most proud of is the fact that not only have we gotten 20 million people covered, not only have we been able to reduce the pace at which health care costs have been going up uh, ever since the laws passed, basically health care inflation has been as low as it's been in 50 years, which has saved the federal government uh, hundreds of billions of dollars, uh, extended the, the Medicare trust fund by 11 years. But most importantly, for the people who have gotten insurance through the exchanges, there's been pretty high satisfaction rates, as surveys have shown. So uh, you know, rather than look at public opinion as a whole, the thing I've been most interested in is, how is this affecting the people who have gotten benefits? They, these are real families who have gotten real coverage. And uh, I get letters every single day from people who say, this has saved my life, or this has saved my bank account, or this has made sure that uh, my son, who got hooked on some sort of opioid, was able to get treatment, uh, or uh, I was able to get a, a mammogram uh, that caught uh, a cancer in time. And, and that ultimately is uh, the measure of the, uh, the success of the law. So do you think this dynamic where when you reform the healthcare system, you own it, goes the other way? Republicans are beginning with the repeal and delay strategy. President-elect Trump has said that he does want to repeal Obamacare, but he also wants to replace it with something that covers as many people, or he said that at least at certain points. Do you think that the dynamic in which you became responsible for what people didn't like is going to hamper Republican movement in their efforts to change a system that maybe they don't like but does have a lot of people relying on it? Well, well let, me, let me start from, from a, a very simple premise. If it works, I'm, I'm for it. If, if, if something can cover all Americans, make sure that if they have a pre-existing condition, they can still get coverage. Uh, make sure that prescription drugs are affordable. Uh, encourage uh, preventive measures to keep people healthy. Uh, that make sure that uh, you know, in, in rural communities, people have access to uh, substance abuse care or mental health care. That Medicare and Medicaid continue to function uh, effectively. If you can do all that cheaper than we talked about, cheaper than Obamacare achieves, and with better quality, and it's just terrific, I'm for it. I, I think that part of the challenge in this whole debate, and this is true dating back to 2009, back to 2010, uh, is this idea that somehow we had a fixed way of trying to fix the health care system, that we were rigid and stubborn and wouldn't welcome Republican ideas. And if we only had, they had all these great solutions. In fact, if you look at how this law evolved, uh, and I've said this publicly before, if, if I was starting from scratch, I probably would have supported a single payer system because it's just easier to for people to understand and manage, and that's essentially what Medicare is, is a single-payer system for people of a certain age. And people are very satisfied with it, and it's not that uh, complicated to understand uh, or to access services. But that's, that wasn't available. We weren't starting from scratch. So what did I then do? I said, well, where is a system out there that seems to be providing coverage for everybody? 
uh, that politically we could actually get through a Congress and where we could get Republican support. And lo and behold, in Massachusetts, there was a plan that had been designed on a bipartisan basis, including by a Republican governor who ultimately became the nominee for the Republican Party that came close to providing universal coverage. And I would have thought, since this was uh, an idea that had previously gotten a lot of Republican support, that it would continue to get a lot of Republican support. And yet somehow, magically, the minute we said, this is a great idea and it's working, uh, Republicans said, this is terrible and we don't want to do this. So I, I say all this, Ezra, simply to, to, to make something very clear. From the very start, in the earliest negotiations in 2009, 2010, I made clear to Republicans that if they had ideas that they could show would work better than the ideas that we had thought of, I would be happy to incorporate them into the law. And rather than offer ideas, what we got was uh, a big no. We just don't want to do this. After the law passed for the last six, seven years, there has been the argument that we can provide a great replacement that will be much better for everybody than what uh, the Affordable Care Act is providing. Uh, and yet, over the last six, seven years, there's been no actual replacement law that any credible uh, health care uh, policy experts have said would work better. In fact, many of them uh, would result in millions of people losing coverage and the coverage being worse for those who kept it. And so now, uh, is the time when Republicans, I think, have to go ahead and show their cards. If, in fact, they have a program that would genuinely work better, and they want to call it whatever they want, they can call it Trump care, they can call it McConnell care or Ryan care, if it actually works, I will be the first one to say, great. We, you should have told me that back in 2009, I asked. <laughs> I suspect that will not happen, and the reason it will not happen is because if you want to provide coverage to people, then there are certain baseline things that you've got to do. Number one, health care is not cheap, and for people who can't afford health care or don't get it through the job, uh, that means the government's got to pay some money. Number two, uh, all those provisions that the Republicans say they want to keep and that they like, uh, for example, making sure that people can get health insurance even if they have a pre-existing condition, well, it turns out that the only way to meet that guarantee is to uh, either make sure that everybody has some modest obligation to get health care so that they're not gaming the system, or you've got to be willing to provide huge subsidies to insurance companies so that they're taking in uh, people who are already sick. Uh, and, and I think what you're going to see now, now that uh, you have a Republican president-elect, you have Republicans control both uh, chambers in Congress, is that all the promises they made about how they can do it better, cheaper, everybody's going to be satisfied, uh, are going to be really hard to meet. And this is why the strategy of repeal first and replace later uh, is just a huge disservice to the American people and is something that uh, I think whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, you should be opposed to. 
these are real lives at stake. I'm getting letters right now from people who say, I am terrified because my son's or daughter's insurance, it, their ability to get life-saving drugs, their ability to get drug treatment, their ability to get mental health services are entirely dependent on us being able to afford and keep our insurance. And if, in fact, there is going to be a massive undoing of what's one-sixth of our economy, then the Republicans need to put forward very specific ideas about how they're going to do it. People need to be able to debate it. They need to be able to study it the same way they did when we passed the Affordable Care Act. And let the American people gauge, is this going to result in something better than what Obamacare has produced? And if they're so convinced that they can do it better, they shouldn't be afraid to make that presentation. It is really interesting to try to figure out why is it that they're trying to rush the repeal so quick? I mean, what, what is it that they're afraid of? Why wouldn't they want to say, here's our plan, and, and show side by side, here's why our plan is better than what Obamacare has produced? Because they, they have said absolutely, adamantly, that they can do it better. I, I am saying to every Republican right now, if you, in fact, can put a plan together that is demonstrably better than what Obamacare is doing, I will, I will publicly support repealing Obamacare and replacing it with your plan. But I want to see it first. <laughs> I want to see it first. And I want, and I want third party, objective people, whether it's the Congressional Budget Office or you know, healthcare experts across the ideological spectrum or Vox or whoever. We'd be happy to, yes. yes. Yeah. Thank you. To just evaluate it. I, I, and and, and, and pe the public will not have to take my word for it. They, they can, you know, we can designate some referees. And if they can show that they can do it better, cheaper, more effective, provide better coverage, why wouldn't I be for it? <laughs> why wouldn't I be for it? This idea that somehow, oh, this is about Obama preserving his legacy. Or, keep in mind, I'm not the one who named it Obamacare. <laughs> They, they were the ones who named it Obamacare because what they wanted to do was personalize this and feed on antipathy towards me in their party as an organizing tool, as politics. But I, I don't have a pride of authorship on this thing. If, 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 if they can come up with something better, I'm for it. But you have to show, and, and I would advise every Democrat to be for it. Mm -hmm. But you have to show that it's better. That, and that's not too much to ask. And that's the challenge. And I, the question right now for Paul Ryan and Mitch McConnell is why is it that you feel obliged to repeal it before you show what it is that's going to replace? Because the majority of Americans have been very clear that they think that's a bad idea. You now have Republican governors, some Republican senators, who've said, we don't think that's an, a good idea. Uh, and there's been no real explanation why you would actually try to do this before the new president's even inaugurated. <laughs> uh, what, what exactly is this rush? Be, particularly if you're going to delay the actual repeal. If they were making the argument that this is so disastrous, that we actually think we have to repeal it completely today because it's, it's just terrible. Well, I would disagree, but at least I could understand it. But here you're saying, I'm, we're going to vote to repeal, but then we're going to, but we're going to delay its effects for a couple of years. Well, why, if it's so bad? And if it's, and if the answer is, well, it would be disruptive and we don't want to take people's insurance away right away, well, then that means you have time to show us and, more importantly, show the American people who need health insurance 
what exactly you're replacing it with. In that sense, Ezra, I know that was a long answer to, <laughs> to but, but, but in that sense, the, the answer is the Republicans, yes, will own the problems with the health care system if they choose to repeal something that is providing health insurance to a lot of people and providing benefits to every American who has health insurance, even if they're getting it through the job, and they haven't shown us what it is that they're going to do. Then they do on it because that is irresponsible. And even members of their own party, even those who are opposed to me, have said that that is an irresponsible thing to do. <laughs> Um, let me follow up a little bit on the congressional fight. So we saw yesterday President-elect Donald Trump, he said on Twitter, quote, it was time for Republicans and Democrats to get together and come up with a health care plan that really works, which is something, you know, I remember you saying similar things in 2009, yeah. 2010, when I was covering this debate. Knowing what you know now about mm -hmm. partisanship, being a president who has tried to do this, was, like you said, unable to get Republican votes. What three pieces of advice would you give someone trying to attempt to pass a bipartisan health care law? Well, uh, look, I, I, I think I sort of gave the advice just now, which is uh, if, in fact, this is not about politics, but this is about providing the best possible health care system for the American people then my advice would be to say, what precisely is it about Obamacare that you think doesn't work? Because you've already said there's some things you think do work. Right? The Republicans keep on saying, well, we want to keep the things that people like and that are working well. So they think it's a good idea that Obamacare says your kids can stay on uh, your health insurance plan until they're 26. They think that's a good idea. They think it's a good idea that if you've got a pre-existing condition, you can still get health insurance. Uh, I assume they think it's a good idea that uh, seniors have gotten discounts on their prescription drugs. We closed the donut hole during, uh, during the course of uh, Obamacare. Uh, they approve of some of the uh, changes we've made to encourage uh, a healthcare system that rewards quality rather than just the number of procedures involved right? the, and, and how we pay providers. So we could make a list of all the things that, as terrible as Obamacare is, actually they think works according to them. All right, well, let's make then a list of the things they don't like uh, or the American people are concerned about. Well, what we know is that uh, people would always like lower costs on their premiums uh, and their out-of-pocket expenses. Uh, and although the Affordable Care Act provides a lot of subsidies to a lot of people so they can afford health insurance, what is absolutely true is we would love to see even higher subsidies to relieve the costs even more. Uh, but that costs money. What we also know is that uh, where we've seen problems in the implementation of the Affordable Care Act, it has been in certain areas, particularly more rural areas, less densely populated areas, where we're not seeing as many insurers, so there's not as much competition. Well, one way that we've suggested you could solve that problem is to uh, say that if, in fact, there aren't enough insurers to drive competition and reduce costs and give people enough choices, then we should have a public option uh, that's available. So if you look at the things that uh, people are frustrated about with Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, the, the big things are the subsidies aren't as high as they'd like and they don't have as many options as they'd like. And I'm happy to provide those, both those things. I'd sign on to a Republican plan that said we're going to give more subsidies to people to make it even cheaper and we're going to have a 
public option uh, where there isn't an option. Here's the problem. I don't think that's the thing that they want to. <laughs> I don't think so now. To do so, but but <laughs> but I guess my point is this: that uh, it is possible for people of goodwill to try to come up with. Uh, significant improvements to the law that we already have, but it does require to be specific about what it is that you think needs to be changed. And that so far has not happened. Uh, and my advice to the President-elect, uh, in fact, we talked about this when I met with him uh, for an hour and a half uh, right after he got elected. I said, you know, make your team and make the Republican members of Congress come up with things that they can show will actually make this work better for people. And if 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 they're convincing, uh, I think you would find that there are a lot of Democrats out there, including me, that'd be prepared to support it. Um, but so far, at least, that's not what's happened. So I think Obamacare has exposed a, an interesting tension between controlling costs in the system and controlling economic pain for individuals. Right. So the law has, until now, come in under budget. But in part, the ways it's done that are higher deductibles than people expected, higher co-pays, narrower networks. Um, in a couple of years, if it doesn't change, the excise tax on high-value insurance will come into play, the individual mandate. And these things, to individual people, while they keep the usage of health care down and they keep the cost of health care down, they make health care feel more expensive. They make health care feel unusable. Do you think the Affordable Care Act got the balance right on controlling system-wide costs versus insulating individuals from their health expenses? Well, I, let me make a couple of distinctions. First of all, um, part of what happened at the beginning uh, of the marketplaces, uh, and and for those who aren't wonks, I I was teasing, I was teasing Ezra and Sarah. I said this is like a wonka palooza. <laughs> <laughs> to, uh, you know, they, these these this is some serious policy uh, uh, detail here. But um, so the marketplaces are basically just uh, those places where insurers put up here's. Uh, you know, here, here's the insurance package we're offering, and you can choose from a variety of different packages. And then once you've chosen, you can figure out the, uh, the subsidies that you're qualified for, and it'll give you a sense of what your out-of-pocket costs are. And what we've discovered was that a lot of insurers underpriced early on because they had done surveys and, look, People who are purchasing health insurance are, are like people who are purchasing everything else. They'd like to get the best deal for the lowest price. What makes healthcare tricky is when you buy a TV, you can kind of see what the picture looks like. When you're buying health insurance, it's tempting to initially buy the cheapest thing until if, heaven forbid, you get sick and it turns out, gosh, I can't see the doctor I want or the specialist I want or uh, you know, uh, th this is more inconvenient than I expected. So, so what ended up happening was people bought the, oftentimes the cheapest insurance that they could. Insurance companies wanting to get as much market share as possible ended up uh, uh, creating a very low cost uh, plans. Uh, but those are going to have restrictions on. Uh, and, and that's not just if you're buying health insurance in Obamacare, that's generally how it is even when employers buy health insurance for their employees. Uh, now I think that what we're seeing is uh, insurers now making adjustments, mm -hmm. saying, okay, uh, we need to charge more. And that uh, is something that the good news is, appears to may have stabilized. That might be a kind of a one-time thing. And now we're able, we're in a position to be able to do an evaluation of uh, have we gotten this balance right, as you, as you say. 
Um, we can't get health care for free. Uh, you're going to have to pay for it one way or another. Uh, either the government is going to pay more so that people uh, don't have as many out-of-pocket costs, or, and that means in some fashion, higher taxes for somebody, or uh, individuals are going to have to pay more out-of-pocket in one way or another. Uh, the same is true for employers. I, you know, either employers pay more for a really good health care package, but that takes something out of the employer's bottom line, or they're putting more costs onto workers uh, in the form of higher deductibles and higher copays. Uh, and I think that a lot of the good work that can be done in lowering costs have to do not with cost shifting, but with actually making the system work better. And we've done a lot of work on that. Uh, you know, what I referred to earlier, incentivizing a system that instead of ordering five tests because doctors and providers are getting paid for the test, you now have a system where you're going to get reimbursed if uh, the person gets healthy quicker and is not returned to the hospital. Well, it turns out that that can, over time, be a, a real cost reduction. Those are the kinds of things that we're implementing in the system uh, as a consequence of Obamacare. The more we do that kind of stuff, the less we're going to see this cost shifting. But the intention has never been to say, let's make it more expensive for people to get uh, health care so they're going to access the system more. And I think the proof of that is, is that uh, even though uh, per person costs have in, uh, have have not gone up a lot. The overall spending on healthcare has gone up because more people have come into the system. We want people to use the healthcare system. We just don't want them to use it in the emergency room. We want them to use it uh, to stay healthy and smoking cessation plans and making sure that they're getting regular checkups and uh, mammograms and. Uh, you know, th those are the things that are ultimately going to save us as much money as we can. I have a wonky follow-up question. There you since go. This is a wonk <laughs> fetch. What about controlling prices? Um, we have some of the highest healthcare prices in the world. In the United States, yep. most other developed countries, they regulate how much you can charge for an MRI, for an emergency right. room visit, an appendectomy. That seems like it's really at the core of this tension, the fact that we have these very high prices. Americans don't go to the doctor more. We just pay a lot more when we right. go to the doctor. That is something the healthcare law did not tackle. Yeah. And I'm curious just to hear you reflect on that and what you would think about the role of price controls in American medicine. Well, look, this is, this is the irony of, of this whole debate, is the things that people are most dissatisfied with about Obamacare, about the Affordable Care Act, are uh, things that essentially in other countries are solved by more government control, <laughs> not less. Yes. And so Republicans are pointing at these things to stir up dissatisfaction, but when it comes to, all right, what's the solution for it, their answer is less government regulation and letting <laughs> folks charge even more and doing whatever they want and letting the marketplace work uh, its will. Uh, I think that there are strengths to our system because we have a more market-based system. Our healthcare system is more innovative. Prescription drugs is probably the best example of this. It is true that we essentially come up with the new drugs in this country and because our drug companies are uh, fat and wealthy enough that they can invest in the research and development. They make bigger profits, which they can then plow back into drug development. And essentially, we have a lot of other countries that are free riders on that system. So they can negotiate with the drug companies and force much lower prices, but they generally don't have a drug industry that develops new drugs. That's true. This is an example of where you probably do want some balance to maintain innovation, but 
to have some tougher negotiations uh, around the system as a whole. And uh, we are tr trying to use Medicare as the place where since you know, there's no health care provider or uh, stakeholder in the healthcare industry that doesn't in some ways want to get uh, Medicare business, we're trying to use Medicare as a lever to uh, get better deals for consumers and better prices for consumers, not just those in Medicare, but also people throughout the system. Um, but as I said, the irony is, is that when we try to do that, the people who are most resistant are the very Republican members of Congress who are criticizing us, or at least uh, telling the American people that uh, uh, you, know, you, you should want lower prices on, on, uh, on various procedures. Um, if we want to control prices for consumers more, then the marketplace by itself will not do that. Uh, and the reason is because healthcare is not exactly like other products. It's not like buying a flat screen TV. If, if you're sick, more, or if your kid is sick, uh, most of the time you're not in a position to negotiate right there and then. You can't walk out of the store and just say, well, I'm gonna see if I can get a better deal. You're trying to figure out, like when Sasha get, got meningitis when she was four months old, make my child better. And that's all, and I'll, I'll worry about the cost later. And that's the mentality that most people have when it goes into healthcare. So the traditional models of uh, the marketplace don't work perfectly in the healthcare system. There are areas where we can increase marketplace competition. There are ways in which we can make it work better. But ultimately, if we want to really get at some of these costs, there has to be uh, some more extensive regulation than we, uh, in certain areas than we currently have. So I, re I recently took a trip to an area of Kentucky on a slightly different topic that saw some huge coverage gains under the health care law, right. but also voted overwhelmingly for President-elect Trump. And one of the people I met there was Kathy Aller, who is here with us today. Um, she's an Obamacare enrollment worker who has signed up more than 1,000 people for coverage. Um, she supported you in 2008 and 2012, but voted for President-elect Trump in 2016 and expects him to improve on the Affordable Care Act. And she would like to ask you a question about that. Go ahead, Kathy. <laughs> Is it working? I don't know. Let's see if it's on. Yeah, it's on. Yeah, it looks on. Oh, All right. okay. I'm supposed to karaoke now. <laughs> um, hello, President Obama. I'm so excited to meet you. It's good to but, see you. Uh, thanks. Um, I'm a little bit nervous, as you can see. But over the years, I've enrolled and talked to numerous Kentuckians. And I've signed up some for even the first time. So it was working, the Affordable Care Act. And also, we've been going over the years and I've talked to people. But recently, we found out that um, there was fewer choices in our area. And the, the increase in the premiums and deductibles. And our facilities aren't even taking some of them. And many Kentuckians now are looking at the affordable care as unaffordable and unusable. And I have the opportunity to ask you a few questions that you have probably went over. But um, how do you think this happened? How can we fix it? Um, do we start all over again? What do you think we should do? Well, first of all, Kathy, I, I want to thank you for being out there and rolling people. Thank you. That's been hugely important. And, you know, um, uh, the, the, the second point I would make is that Kentucky is a place where this has really worked, and it's worked for two reasons. One is Kentucky uh, expanded Medicaid, and we haven't talked a lot about that, but a big chunk of Obamacare was just making Medicaid accessible to more people. And those states that expanded Medicaid have seen a much bigger drop in the uninsured than those states who didn't. And by the way, those states that didn't 
uh, they didn't do so just out of politics. I, I'll just be very blunt. Um, because the federal government was going to pay for this Medicaid expansion. And states, there are some states, because they had all this uncompensated care and uh, ended up making money by providing more health insurance to your people. It was, it was a hard bargain, a hard deal to turn down, and yet you got a number of states that turned it down mainly because Republican governors and Republican state legislatures didn't want to make it work. Uh, Kentucky, uh, under Steve Bashir, was one of those people uh, that did expand Medicaid, had a really active program. Because I don't poll that well in, uh, in Kentucky, they didn't call it Obamacare. They called it uh, Connect. Connect, Kentucky Connect, right? And, uh, right. and so there were a whole lot of people who said, well, we don't like Obamacare, but I like this program. <laughs> And, and we'll sign you up, right? You, you sign people up. You didn't tell them it was, it was uh, Obamacare all the time. Uh, and, and, it, and it's actually worked, right? Uh, now, what is true in Kentucky, though, uh, is true in some other states. You had a governor who ran explicitly on the idea of rolling back Obamacare, even though it was working. Uh, and so the state marketplace, the state exchange, he dismantled, which means we had to shift everything onto the federal exchange. Most people got shifted, but uh, it, it indicated a lack of interest and effort on his part in making the thing work. Uh, he promised to roll back Medicaid, but he started realizing that wasn't as good politics as he thought it was when he was running, so he hasn't done that. Um, but what is also true is, and, and, and this is my main criticism of Obamacare, of the Affordable Care Act, is that the subsidies aren't as high as they probably should be for a lot of working people. If, if you don't qualify for Medicaid, where you don't have to pay, for the most part, for your coverage, and instead you're buying health insurance on the marketplace. So you're a working person, but you don't have a lot of money. Uh, and particularly if you are uh, older, where you use the health care system more, and you need a better benefit package than somebody 18 or 20 might, then there, there are families where the, the premiums are still too high. And as I said earlier, there are some parts of the country where there are only a handful of hospitals and a few doctors, and where you don't have a lot of competition, and the insurers are looking and they're saying, I'm not, we're not going to make a lot of money there. So you don't end up having a lot of insurance plans in those areas. So the two things that we could do that would really make it work even better for people in Kentucky would be, number one, provide more subsidies to folks who are working hard every day but still find the premiums, even with the subsidies, hard to meet. Uh, and uh, have a public option for uh, those communities where they're not getting a lot of competition and insurers aren't coming in. The problem is, is that that's not what's being proposed by Mitch McConnell, the senator from Kentucky. <laughs> Instead, what he's proposing, I gather, is you're going to repeal the law, then you're going to come up with something, except you will have taken away all the, the way we pay for the subsidies for working people is we're taxing wealthier folks at a little bit higher. So he wants to cut those taxes. And that, money's going, that money would be gone right away. And then he's going to promise you, or those people who you've been signing up, better health care, except there's not going to be any money to pay for it. And nobody's explained to me yet how that's going to work. Uh, and, and so uh, I, I think this takes me back to the point I made earlier. Uh, if, in fact, 
the people you've been signing up, the folks in your communities, uh, are not fully satisfied with uh, the benefits that they're getting now and are hopeful for something better, then at the very least you should be putting pressure on your members of Congress to say, show us exactly what the deal is going to be for us before you take away the deal that we got. Because the people you sign up for, they may not be as happy as they'd like, but tell me if I'm wrong, they like it better than ha not having any insurance at all. And some people didn't have insurance, and, and finally, because I get letters from folks who say, for the first time in my life, I, I, I have had a bad hip for 15 years, and I've been pain free for the first time because I finally got insurance. Right? Mm -hmm. So I, I, the answer is not for them not to have insurance. Uh, and if we go back to a system where they've got to buy it on their own, they're not going to buy it because they'll have even less subsidy. Um, how much time do we got? I think we're quite low. <laughs> we so, got low time because I got, I got all kinds of more stuff. <laughs> well, it's your schedule. We're happy to keep you as long as you'd like. Well, but well, I, well why don't you, uh, uh, there are a couple points I want to make in closing, but why don't you excellent. ask, ask uh, some questions? So one thing we haven't touched on yet yeah. in much detail is the delivery system reforms, yeah. which are a big part of the law. Right. So what is a policy or experiment or change in that space that has overperformed your expectations, and what's one that has maybe not panned out as you'd liked or hoped? You know, I think a good example of something that's worked better than we uh, expected, or at least worked as well as we expected, is the issue of hospital readmissions. Now, uh, it turns out that a lot of times, uh, you go to the hospital, let's say you get your appendix taken out, uh, and then you go home and then there's a complication and then you have to go back in, into the hospital. That's obviously inconvenient for you and it's expensive for the system as a whole. And it turns out that there are just a few things that you can do that help reduce people being readmitted. You know, first of all, making sure that the first procedure goes well, but secondly, making sure that there's good follow-up. So it might be that uh, a hospital or a healthcare system pays for, uh, when you do go home, you just getting some phone calls to remind you to take the uh, medicine that you got to take to make sure you heal properly. Because if, you know, they may have done a study and it turns out that, uh, People forget uh, to, to do what they're supposed to do. They don't follow exactly their doctor's instructions, and they can't afford to have a nurse in their house who's doing it for them. Well, maybe there are just some, a few things that can be done to help make sure that they do what they are supposed to do, and that way they don't have complications. Uh, what we've seen is a significant reduction in hospital readmissions over the course of this law, just by doing some smart incentivizing, just, just saying to the hospitals, we'll reimburse you or we'll uh, give you some other benefit for doing smart follow-up. Uh, that's an area where I think we've made uh, some real progress. Um, the other place, and this is connected, where I think we've got some good bipartisan support is just encouraging what's called uh, shifting from what's called uh, fee-for-service payments uh, where you get paid by the procedure which means that uh, you may end up getting five tests instead of getting one test that's emailed to five <laughs> providers who are treating you uh, and and we've started to see some real movement when we say to the system as a whole um, we're going to pay you for outcomes. Did the patient do well? Uh, and, and that has been uh, helpful. Uh, in terms of areas where uh, I think we haven't uh, seen as much improvement as I'd like, it's probably one thing that comes to mind is on the electronic uh, medical records. 
give, if you think about how wired and plugged in everybody is now, you know, I mean, you can basically do everything off your phone. The fact that there are still just mountains of paperwork <laughs> and you don't understand what these bills are that still get sent to your house and uh, nobody, that, and the doctors still have to input stuff and the nurses are spending all their time on all this administrative work. We put a big slug of money into trying to encourage everybody to digitalize, you know, catch up with the rest of the world here. And it's proven to be harder than we expected, uh, partly because everybody has different systems. They don't all talk to each other. Uh, it requires retraining people in how to use them effectively. Uh, and I, I'm optimistic that over time, it, it's inevitable that it's gonna get better because every other part of our lives, uh, it's, it's you know, become paperless. But it's been a lot slower than I would have expected. Uh, and, and some of it has to do with uh, the fact that, as I said, it's decentralized and everybody has different systems. In some cases, you have sort of economic incentives that are pushing against making the system work better. For example, you know, there are service providers. People make money on keeping people's medical records. Mm -hmm. and then, So making it easier for everybody to access each other's medical records means that there's some folks who could lose business. Uh, and, and that has turned out to be a little more complicated than I expected. Mm -hmm. Do you have any closing remarks? And one I, thing I'm interested in is kind of what you see your role in this debate we're gearing up for as. Well, let, let, let me make a couple of closing remarks. Number one, um, I think it is important to remember that uh, just because people campaigned on repealing this law. Uh, it is a much more complicated process to repeal this law than I think it was being presented on the campaign trail as my Republican friends are discovering. Uh, the way this process is gonna work, there's this rushed vote that's taken place this week, next week, uh, to quote unquote repeal Obama care. But really all that is is it's a resolution that is then instructing uh, these committees in Congress to start actually drafting a law that specifically would say what's being repealed and what's not. Then after that, they'd have to make a decision about what's going to replace it and how long is that going to take? And that stretches the process out further. Uh, and so I think whether you originally supported Obamacare or you didn't, whether you like me or you don't, the one thing I would just ask all the American people to do is adopt the slogan of the great state of Missouri, show me. <laughs> show me do not rush this process and to Republicans I would say what are you scared of you sh if you are absolutely convinced as you have been adamant about for the last seven years that you can come up with something better go ahead and come up with it and I'll, I'll even cut you some slack for the fact that you've been saying you'd come up with something better for seven years, and I've never seen it. Uh, but, but we'll restart the clock. Uh, it's interesting that we're here in Blair House because this is a, a place where I met in front of the American people with Republicans who had already indicated their adamant opposition to health care. And I sat with them for a couple hours how long was it? Eight, Eight hours. <laughs> <laughs> Kathleen Sebelius, who was my Secretary of Health and Human Services, remember, for eight hours on live TV to talk about, here's 
why we're trying to do what we're doing here and uh, challenging them to come up with better answers than the ones we had come up with. And you know, we spent a year of, of really significant debate. Uh, and I would think that given that we now have proof that 20 million people do have health insurance, that we're at the lowest rate of uh, uninsured in our history, that health care costs, rather than spiking way up, have actually gone up slower than they have in 50 years. Uh, given that the vast majority of people who get health insurance through Obamacare have said they're satisfied with their care uh, and that they're better off than when they didn't have care. Given that, even though a lot of people don't know it, even if you're not getting health insurance through Obamacare, you've benefited because if you get health insurance on the job, it now doesn't have a lifetime limit. It doesn't have fine print that could end up costing you a lot of money. Uh, given all those things, I, I would think that you'd at least want to explain to the American people what it is that uh, you want to do. Uh, and, and that, I think, is a, uh, a, a minimum uh, expectation out of this Congress and out of the President-elect. I'd make a second point, and that is that we just worked on a bipartisan basis to sign something called uh, uh, the Cures Bill uh, that included two really important bipartisan priorities. One was Joe Biden's uh, cancer moonshot initiative because we're seeing so many medical breakthroughs in so many areas that we have an opportunity to make a real dent in how we deal with cancer, uh, which affects everybody in some fashion. Somebody's been touched in, their, in your family uh, with, with this terrible disease. Uh, so we got a lot more money for research in that, and the bill also contained a big investment in opioid, uh, the opioid challenge. Uh, as many of you know, uh, you're seeing more and more communities that are being ravaged by initially prescription drugs, then that ends up being a, a gateway into heroin, uh, some of which, uh, like synthetic heroin being produced called fentanyl, uh, just has terrible uh, uh, rates of, of overdose deaths. And this is not a inner city problem per se, but this is reaching every community. In some ways, it's worse in a lot of rural communities. So there was a bipartisan effort for us to put some more money into that. But here's the thing. If we just put money into cancer research and we just put money into dealing with uh, the opioid crisis, and now we're taking away money that is providing drug treatment services <laughs> in those very same communities by repealing Obamacare and taking away the ability to access a doctor to get new cancer treatments, then we're not really helping anybody. So, so that's uh, a, a second point I want to make. A third point I want to make is that uh, I would encourage local communities to get involved in this process. Um, and, you know, I, I think the Part of the problem with this whole law has been that the people who benefit aren't out there making noise. Uh, and the people who ideologically have opposed it have been really loud. Well, now's the time for people who have benefited or seen their families benefit uh, to tell their stories. Uh, because ultimately this is not a, this is not a political game. Th this is this is really something that affects people in, in the most personal ways. I, my friend Natoma Canfield is here uh, in the front row. Um, some of you heard Natoma's story before where you know, a cancer survivor who, because she had now a pre-existing condition, was faced with either keeping her health insurance at such a high rate, the only way she could get health insurance with a pre-existing condition was 
to, to basically pay so much that she could no longer afford to pay the mortgage on her house. And I remember her writing to me, and, and I thought, you know, that could be my mom. Uh, that, could, that could be yours. And that's not a choice that people should have to make. And when most people, even if they're not Obama supporters, hear Natoma's story or the stories of other people who've been helped, uh, they know it's wrong to just take away their health care. And it, it, it becomes less about who's winning here in Washington. It becomes about how are we doing right by our fellow Americans. But those stories have to be heard. Uh, and I would just encourage people uh, to, to, to start telling their stories. And tell their stories, you know, you're not always going to get a lot of attention here in Washington because they want to know this vote and this insult that was hurled back and forth between whoever. But you know what? T tell, tell that story in, in your local newspapers. Talk to your local reporters, uh, you know, congregations uh, that are uh, involved in caring for those in need. Make sure that uh, you're, you're telling stories in church and uh, in, in services uh, so that people know. Be because the, the, the one thing that I'm, I'm convinced about is the American people want to do the right thing. They just, it's, it's hard to get good information. And, you know, unless you're reading Vox every day, which is hard to do. <laughs> Uh, it's not that hard to do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Getting the details of all this policy is, is, is it's hard. It's complicated. You don't know what's true. You don't know what's, what's not true. Um, I mean, those folks in Kentucky that you've signed up, you know, there, there are a lot of people who voted for not just a president, but also for a member of Congress who said explicitly, we're going to eliminate this. Well, I understand why people might think, OK, well, he's going to eliminate it, but he'll, he will give us something better. But this is hard. I, you know, and, and, and what you don't want is a situation where they, they make a promise that they can't keep. Um, and, and, and I worked on this a long time. If we had had a better way to do this, we would have done it. It would have been in my interest to do it because I knew I was going to be judged on whether or not it worked. And those areas that don't work have to do with there not being enough money in the system and not having a public option. And I'm more than happy to put those fixes in place anytime, any place. But I, that's not so far what the Republicans are proposing. You, you deserve to know what it is that they're doing. So anyway, I appreciate uh, you guys taking the time to but Real quick, Sarah, tell asked about your role going forward. Oh, my, my role going forward? Uh, <laughs> well, look, no, I, I mean, uh, I do deserve a little sleep. <laughs> so. Uh, and I've got to take Michelle on, on, on a vacation. Uh, and uh, uh, so, but, but, but he, I, I, I've said consistently that the most important office in a democracy is the office of citizen. And uh, I will be a citizen who still remembers what it was like when his mom died of cancer, younger than I am now, and who didn't have uh, all the insurance and disability insurance and support and wasn't using the healthcare system enough to uh, have early detection that might have prevented her from passing away. Uh, you know, Michelle's dad had multiple sclerosis, MS, but was part of that generation that just didn't have a lot of expectations about health care and so just kind of suffered and for years and I mean those are our stories so it's not like I'm gonna suddenly fade away on this I I I will be a part of the work of our 
fellow citizens uh, in trying to make sure that the wealthiest country on earth is able to do the same thing that every other advanced country is able to do. I mean, it's not as if uh, this has never been done before. You, if you're in Canada, you got health care, no matter who you are. If you're in France, you got health care. If you're in England, you got health care. If, you, if, you if you're in Australia, you got health care. If you're in New Zealand, you got health care. I remember talking to my friend John Key, who was the Prime Minister of New Zealand. He is part of the Conservative Party in New Zealand. And he, he, he said to me in the middle of this health care debate, he said, boy, if I proposed that we took away people's health care, that we repealed it, I'd be run out of office by my own party. <laughs> because it was just assumed that in a country this wealthy, that this is one of the basic rights, not privileges, of uh, citizenship in, in, uh, in, in a well-to-do country like ours. So, um, so, so I'll be working with all of you, but, but my voice is going to be less important uh, than the voices of, of people who are directly affected. And, uh, and so I would urge everybody to, to make your voice heard. Now is the time to do it. The people who have opposed this were opposing it not based on facts, but were opposing it based on uh, sort of an ideological concern about expansion of the state and uh, sort of taxes on wealthier people that are helping people who don't have as much money. And, and, uh, and I, I respect their role in the democracy. Uh, they've been really fighting hard. Well, folks here got to fight just as hard. My final piece of uh, advice would be to the news media, which is, we, generally speaking, when uh, Obamacare's worked well, it wasn't attributed to Obamacare. And when uh, there were problems, they got front page headlines. And I think that hopefully now is a time where people can be a little, uh, this doesn't apply to Vox, by the way, but, <laughs> but, I, I, but I think it'd be a good time for people to be a little more measured and take a look at what's the, what, what are the facts uh, of this thing, um, because the stakes are high. Even on this whole premium issue, uh, increase issue that happened right before the election, uh, it is true, as I said, that insurers adjusted and, and hiked premiums. But I, I kept on trying to explain, number one, if you're getting a tax subsidy, this wasn't going to affect your out-of-pocket costs because the tax credit would just go up, but nobody kind of heard that. And number two, these increases in premiums only applied to people who are buying health insurance on the exchanges. In fact, 85 percent of the people don't get health insurance through Obamacare. And for you, your health care premiums actually have gone up a lot less since Obamacare was passed than they did before Obamacare was passed. The average family has probably saved about $3,000 in lower health care premiums than if you had seen those same health care cost trends uh, increase uh, at, at the pace that they did before the law was passed. But, you know, I didn't see a lot of headlines about that, but, which I understand, I mean, because it, it's, not, it's not controversial enough. Um, uh, or or it's a little bit too complicated to get in a sound bite. So that's why individual voice is so important, and that's why I'm so appreciative of uh, uh, journalists who actually know what they're talking about. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. All right, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.